Right. Good morning and um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's Dr. Mohammed here. I'm a head of scientific committee for the African Society of Fusion and Anesthesia. On behalf of the African Society of Fusion and Anesthesia, I welcome all of you. Right. Um, Africa, home of vast morning, desert and, um, and tropical uh, rainforest, bright mountains um, and fertile uh, uh, grasslands, Africa, continent of exploration and beauty. So today we are all together live on the same land and I'm really blessed to be part of this brilliant team and sharing uh, uh, the knowledge and spreading the old experience of prison anesthesia to our people. So today we are all together. So I'm really pleased to um, introduce um, uh, Professor Amani Ayat. She's the secretary for the African Society of Fusion and Anesthesia, and she's the chair for um, the middle section of World Institute of Pain. She's with us today, and she's going to give us a small brief about uh, uh, the African Society of Fusion and Anesthesia and the certain activities we are going ahead today. So over to you, Professor Amani. Um, the section okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, good morning, everybody, wherever you are. We're so glad to be with you. On behalf of the whole AFSA board, allow me to give you a warm welcome in this uh, fruitful meeting. And I wish it will be very much enjoyable because I know the content will be uh, very helpful. But before that, allow me in two minutes to tell you the story, our story, the AFSA story. Uh, in the year 2010, a group of motivated anesthesiologists from Africa, from Egypt, from Nigeria, and from uh, South Africa, uh, we had a look on the map, and we found that uh, there is an American Society of Regional Anesthesia of Pain, ASRA. Uh, there is European one, ASRA. There is another one in Latin America, the LASRA, and the Australian one, AWISRA but there was a beautiful continent that is missing. Uh, we dreamed of having this. We dreamed of having um, a society that can deliver uh, a better education to our doctors that we believe they do deserve a better treatment, a better education, and our patients, they do, de they do, do, they do deserve um, a better opportunity. So we started working on that shortly, in 2010, by the end of the year, it was launched. To our surprise, it was launched. And we kept going on the, uh, on the ground. Initially, we, um, we, have hold, uh, we have to hold a big event every year uh, in the form of a conference and a workshop. Uh, and by the way, this year, we'll, we'll be hosting the 10th uh, International Conference of the AFSA. But this was not enough. Um, we started collaborating with other societies in Africa, like the Egyptian Society of Anesthesiologists, like uh, um, uh, Nigeria, like a society from Sudan, but this was not enough to us. In the year of 2014, to our surprise, we won the bid. We were the host of the World Congress of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Therapy, and we hosted that in South Africa, in Cape Town, and four years later, we contributed in the organization of the next World Congress of Regional Anesthesia and Pain in New York. But you know what? This was not enough. Early this year, and I have to give all the thanks to Dr. Muhammad Mustafa, who had a brilliant idea. We wanted to reach the unreachable. We wanted to reach every doctor in Africa. And this is very tough and very difficult, by the way. So Dr. Muhammad suggested a wonderful suggestion that we can have ambassadors ambassador to be a link between the ASRA and the doctors on the ground. And uh, here we are, this is our baby step. The first one with this webinar, we're delighted to be with the uh, doctors from Zambia. So we're so glad because finally, we're about to reach the unreachable. So allow me to introduce Dr. 
uh, Nasibu Muanda. Dr. Nasibu was graduated from the Medi uh, Faculty of Medicine from Turku, from Istanbul, but he practices currently in the UK. Uh, Dr. Nasibu with an experience for 15 years of uh, emergency medicine, and he is currently uh, the vice chair of the Tanzania UK Healthcare Diaspora Association. He conducts a volunteering work and activity everywhere just to connect and to help his people in Tanzania back. So uh, Dr. Uh, Masibu, the floor is yours now and a warm thank you, a warm sense of gratitude to you because you gave us this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Carry on Dr. Masibu, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, to introduce, uh, my name is Dr. Nasibu Mwande. I'm from Tanzania. And uh, currently in Tanzania, as you can see, in the beautiful land, the sun is shining, it's a bit drizzly. I'm sorry about the technology. I'm not at home, I'm outside, bringing, all, bringing the, whole, uh, the whole show from outside. Now, thank you very much for everyone who decided to attend uh, this uh, fantastic uh, webinar. And I think it'll be a huge, and I think there's a lot we can give to our people uh, regarding uh, analgesia. And we have a panel of a lot of good experts, experienced, and who are well and very happy to share their knowledge with uh, everyone in here. Now, probably, can you hear me? Yes. But I think I'm, I keep losing. Yeah. Okay. So. I think we, 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 we're going to, I was supposed to be demonstrating the fascia iliaca block as well, something to go along the trauma, but I think it, because of the technology and stuff, things are not as planned. So I think it, I'm not going to take much of your time. I'm just want to say that this webinar is coming from Tanzania with collaboration with Tumbi uh, Regional Referral Hospital in, in the coast region. And I, this hospital, I think, uh, see quite a lot of trauma. I think this uh, uh, talk today comes at the right time and to see what we can do locally and uh, international as well by sharing knowledge. So with further ado, I'm gonna introduce, uh, I'm gonna let Dr. Sonia take the floor. Thank you. Over to you, Sonia. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Naz. I'm, 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 well, before we go into Sonia, I'm just going to give a, a little bit more about uh, Dr. Sonia Lala. She's a consultant anesthetist and um, uh, being trained in the UK. She graduated from Leicester University, uh, being trained in the northeast of England in the UK, and she's from Kenya. She's practicing now as a consultant anesthetist uh, uh, in Kenya. She, uh, she's very interested in regional anesthesia specialties like major surgery. Uh, perioperative medicine, complex airways. Um, uh, so she's passionate also about the quality and diversity, and she was organizing a very fantastic field um, event, which is called Leveling the Field with um, uh, eliminating all the differences between the, uh, the people with the different ethnic uh, minorities. So uh, I'm really glad to have Dr. Sonia here, and she's going to give us uh, a very interesting talk about the safety for uh, labor analgesia. And um, uh, we're going to keep the question and answers to the end. Um, I know that we have um, uh, also live streaming in YouTube if you want to follow it. Uh, and hopefully at the end, we'll, um, uh, you will going to enjoy um, Dr. Sonia's lecture today. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, welcome to the African Society for Regional Anesthesia webinar. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking to you about labor analgesia. Um, I'll be running through things in quite a broad aspect so that I can cover as much as I can. Um, I have put my email address and Twitter handle at the end of the presentation. So if you do have any questions or um, any comments or anything that you'd like to say, or if you'd like to share some slides or anything of that sort, let me know, or you can email through AFSRA um, and we'll be able to share a few things out with yourselves. So before I start, um, just 
saying words with no meaning. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, there we go. Right, so I hope you can all see the screen. I have on purpose left um, this presentation as bland as possible so that I can um, talk to you and emphasize a few points without you getting distracted um, with all the wonderful pictures of women in labor. Um, so labor analgesia, are we doing enough? Um, before I start off officially, I have a few disclaimers. So I'm not an obstetric anesthetist. However, like most of us um, who have done any form of anesthesia, it is hard to keep ourselves away for any duration of time from uh, the birthing suite or any women um, who tend to come in in labor. It's part and parcel of our training. It's part and parcel of our daily job, our daily role, um, which is why it's quite an important aspect I can't think of any anaesthetist who may have, you know, been through um, their career without having come across obstetric anaesthesia. However, anything too niche or too specific, um, I'm probably not the best person to ask about. Second disclaimer is I haven't practiced widely within Africa. <clears throat> I have just moved um, to Kenya, relocated back to Kenya. Um, so majority of my obstetric and anesthetic practice has been based in the UK. So again, please do feel free to tell me if I'm right or wrong, or if my practices differ, you know, significantly, or if actually you see similar things uh, within your countries um, and within your practices. We're all here to learn, so um, I'm happy to learn as I am to teach. Um, so having said that, there's a lot that can be said about labor um, in itself, uh, in terms of physiology, in terms of um, maternal health, um, in terms of pain relief itself. So I'm not going to dwell into the physiological changes of pregnancy, and I'm certainly not going to talk to you about pain pathways. Um, I'm sure you can read up on that and refresh your knowledge um, when it comes to how pain is perceived um, through labor. However, the things I will be talking to you about are labor pains, why we need to use analgesia. Um, we love a bit of science, so a little bit about evidence-based medicine or the lack of, um, and my personal favorite when I approach anything that requires analgesia, and that's the four P's. Um, right, without further ado, what is pain? Um, now, we all have faced and um, felt pain in various forms. There is various scientific definitions of it. Um, the one that I'm going to use is from the International Association for the Study of Pain. This was a definition that they refined in 2020. And it says that pain is generally an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated, associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Um, what this tells me is that pain is not only felt currently, you can also have pain from an experience today, you can feel that tomorrow and the day after. Um, not only is it a sensory perception, it is also an emotional experience. So when we think about making um, a certain aspect of someone's life better with regards to abolishing or even just minimizing pain, we're looking at not only making the experience in the present better, but also to improve their emotional perception of the pain in order to, to, to make the, the future experiences better as well. Uh, and the one thing I can think of in labor is that every one of these words is relevant. It is a sensory experience. It is an emotional experience. It resembles actual pain. It resembles potential tissue damage. Um, and so all of these factors 
are probably the one thing that we should be looking at why um, in labor we need to make things a bit better. So with that context, what is labor pain? So labor pain is known to be one of the worst imaginable pains women experience. Um, oh, I put down too much experience in there. Women experience and are likely to experience during their childbearing age. The Association of Anesthetists, of, uh, or sorry, the American Society of Anesthesia and the College of the Obstetric and Gynecologists have actually said in no other circumstances under which it is acceptable for a person to experience untreated severe pain, which is amenable to intervention under phys physician's care. So in no other situation would you let someone continue being in untreated severe pain when you have the capabilities of reducing it. So what happens when you leave labor pain untreated? Um, a little bit of physiology here. So as with every other pain, you've got this excessive release of catecholamines where what happens is that you end up with an increased peripheral vascular resistance, which affects your cardiac output. It decreases placental perfusion. And what you end up with is incoordinated contractions. You then end up with maternal hypertension, which in um, when it comes to various sorts of maternal obstetric pathologies, such as preeclampsia, um, the last thing we need is an increased blood pressure to secondary to pain. Cardiovascular stress, which automatically um, translates to fetal distress by a decrease of oxygen um, because the majority of the oxygen is being used by the mother. Um, and because of that, you end up with less going to the fetus, end up with fetal distress. Again, a situation we don't want to be in. And of course, there's hyperventilation. So in a situation where the mother is hyperventilating enough to cause respiratory alkalosis, you end up with a um, pH imbalance, um, which in itself um, creates various physiological changes that are not um, useful when it comes to any kind of big stressful situation, especially one where there's lots of blood loss and you end up with um, hemorrhage. So, Severe pain, anxiety, and the increased catecholamine levels are associated with prolonged or dysfunctional labor. Um, this has been, it, it's one of the studies that was done. It's a proven fact. Um, another one of those is that women in developing countries experience postnatal depression at the same rate or rates that are comparable to those in developed countries. And yet we, as a continent don't seem to be faring very well with worrying about our patients experiences uh postnatal depression and the mental health that comes the traumatic um uh events that follow after childbirth however we know that patients have one-to-one -one support whether this be through birthing partners doulas midwives and um, physicians require less interventions, less pain relief, and the labor is actually shorter. So what are we not doing? We're actually within the continent, or if I rephrase that, within generally low resource countries, we are not offering pain relief, and we're not educating women to the fact that they can have pain relief. So we seem to be underselling analgesia through labor for a multitude of reasons, whether it be through cost and um, through the lack of training of our healthcare um, community, um, whether we have no equipment to support that um, uh, training and delivering of uh, analgesia seems to be a barrier with cultural views and expectations um, within our patients um, who come um, to us, especially uh, nulliparous patients. So patients who have not been in labor before um, have these cultural views and expectations, which uh, we don't seem to be challenging too well, um, and attitudes of healthcare professionals. Uh, now, there's a lot I can say here about attitudes. Um, from a variety of uh, professionals, whether it be in you know big centers or even in small district rural hospitals. Um, we seem to be 
letting our patients stay in pain. Uh, we seem to be not empowering them to ask for analgesia, and we most certainly don't seem to be offering them analgesia, even in the antenatal setting, to ex explain to them what um, or help with their expectations of labor. Um, so I'm going to mention a few studies here um, uh, done in a few countries. I'm not uh, picking any countries. We're all as bad as each other. Um, there was a study done in Nigeria in 2014, which looked at, it was done by their um, uh, the College of their obstetricians, um, and it proved that only 49% of the obstetricians were offering analgesia. Um, that study was somewhat repeated four years later in 2018, um, where it was found that even though 78 centers, so 78 maternal centers, um, had an epidural specifically, this one had epidurals available, only 26% were offering it. So quite a significant gap as to why we're not offering analgesia to women. Um, when they might not even be aware of it. Um, there was another study done in Uganda in 2015, a pretty decent sized study of 1,293 participants, and actually only 7% of the participants had knowledge of labor analgesia. And there's been study after study showing that it there's very little um, difference between what, how educated a person is or what background they come from and whether they know about the analgesia techniques that can be offered in uh, through labor. Um, and following that, I thought this was an interesting um, uh, statement that they put there. Almost 90% of mothers who had previously been through labor did not have any labor analgesia. Um, and just under that, so 87.9 did not have it, and only 87.7% of them said that they would want it. So very similar proportion, if offered it, would take analgesia. So we can't just blame um, a, a patient refusal, or, 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 or they probably wouldn't want it, or various cultural um, associations with lack of providing analgesia. What evidence do we have? Unfortunately, there is a lack of high powered RCTs, uh, which made me feel a little bit like this, but lack of high powered RCTs. Um, why? Um, difficult to know why um, not a lot of studies have been done. However, there are some small scale studies that have shown a variety of methods um, proven to be beneficial. Out of these RCTs, the three things that we know for sure improve outcomes or improve um, analgesia. Um, really simple, I wonder if anyone can guess. Um, continuous support. So a trained person having psychological and physical support. So someone like a midwife, a doula, uh, a birthing partner, someone who is supportive and physically present is shown to improve um, perceived pain. Information. So we definitely underestimate our patients because providing prenatal information on what their experiences are likely to be and what their analgesic options are already in itself improves how painful their labor is. So why we're not doing simple, simple things like this in an antenatal setting um, is something we should probably uh, look into. Um, yes, I understand that a lot of us um, end up facing patients who don't have a lot of prenatal antenatal exposure, that, you know, late presentations for whatever reason. Um, and that's a separate, that's a separate bag on its own. But majority of women within this continent um, do have some degree of antenatal support. Um, and we should be looking at um, mentioning to them uh, the options that are available so that they can think about it um, and maybe talking to them a little bit about the experience um, and how you know labor is perceived to be painful and it is likely to be painful um, and then of course regional techniques um, so things like epidurals and CSEs so combined spinal epidurals of various techniques doses um, in various ways are known to be uh, helpful. 
So now my four P's to manage pain. Um, this is a way that was taught to me on how to approach managing pain. It can be used um, in an acute and a chronic situation. Um, it requires a little bit of um, mental mapping of how you're gonna approach pain. All of them can be mixed up. Um, they can all be used independent to each other. They don't all necessarily have to be done by one professional. Um, but this is how I like to think about pain just to ensure that we can get simple things done before or as well as you know more invasive um options so four p's here we go physical psychological pharmacological and procedural so physical what are the things we can do physically to help alleviate pain tens um so ten seems to be quite popular it's one of those things where certain centers have tens machines that patients can borrow out um some people choose to buy some and have them personally so it's transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation it uses the gate theory of pain um in order to um suppress the intensity of pain uh, it's known to be quite popular especially in early labor uh, and and quite uh, useful as well in early labor um immersion so when i say immersion i mean generally like in water so water baths um being able to sit in a tub of water generally it reduces the um the gravity effect of the gravid uterus and again through various um gate theories with water and warm water and dorsal perception um it does seem to have an impact massage this is something you can get the birth partner on or even just a simple massage from um anyone who's helping out whether it's a back massage shoulder massage just general gentle stimulation um is one of the techniques that can be used acupuncture that's something that um, is popular in certain cultures and not at all in certain uh, in others. Um, it's something that can be uh, it has to be obviously provided by a professional who knows what they're doing. Um, and obviously only in certain situations. Um, birthing balls, posture, various postures and um, being on all fours is meant to be a favorable favorable posture for analgesia purposes, but also to um, fast in the birthing process. Sterile water blocks. Um, I've not experienced these myself. I've not come across anywhere in uh, England that does them, um, but they do have their role. And what I gather is that these are small volume sterile water subcutaneous injections that are used around the sacral region of the back around those dermatomes again uses the gate theory um in sorry in order to alleviate pain psychological what can you do having a midwife present having someone professional um present during the birth is a psychological reassurance um for the person going through the whole physiological change uh birthing partner and doula i think i've mentioned this a few times music a little bit of gentle music uh, a playlist made by the patient themselves, uh, something calm and soothing, something distracting, also has a small role to play. Aromatherapy, so smells of various source, uh, various sort um, are known to help. Towards the end of the presentation, I have a table um, which is going to tell you a little bit about certain smells that you can use. Well, it talks a little bit about all of the um, non-invasive uh, procedures and a bit about their studies so we can look at that a little bit more and hypnosis again requires a um a, a, an allied healthcare professional to provide um, uh, this technique pharmacological now i know we're all people of science and we love to get into all the medications uh, and for that one reason i'm not going to talk too much about medications because i would like us all to focus on um alternatives as well so supporting bits of um uh therapy that we can provide other than just the drugs that we thoroughly rely on having said that entonox entonox gas and air is popular all over the country it's one of those things all of all over the world actually it's one of those things which is easily available requires less training can be used by patients supported by any staff 
doesn't need direct observation. Um, of course, you need to be a little bit concerned about kind of ventilation and scavenging the effects it's having on Earth, because we all know what climate change is doing. Um, in addition to the inhalation aspect of Entonox, um, there are certain places that use a small amount of inhalational agents. So a little bit of isoflurane, a little bit of sevoflurane. This, however, of course, does need monitoring, um, and you have to be wary of the scavenging aspect of this. Um, it uh, has been shown to provide analgesia, whether it is in the form of a slight bit of sedation and dissociation, um, but it does have a beneficial outcome. Non-opiates, so simple things working up the WHO ladder, um, paracetamol, non-steroidals, antispasmodics, antispasmodics, and sedatives, especially in the early stages of labor, when um, you're not required to do too much. Um, might just be one of the things that tie them over to buy some time. And then, of course, there's opiates. So it, within the UK, a lot of the midwives um, are uh, able to give intramuscular injections. Um, so a lot of these can be given um, without any doctor, you know, either prescribing it or giving it itself. And that's things like morphine, diamorphine, pethidine. Um, stronger opiates and synthetic ones such as um, fentanyl would have to be overlooked uh, and tend to be given parenterally um, uh, through the IV rather than intramuscularly. Um, there are some more that I'm not very familiar with using myself, especially through labor, other than meptazanol. So we have used meptid again through a midwife uh, led unit, um, but there's all sorts of opiates that you can use. Of course, when using opioids, you need to um, be prepared for uh, these to be passed on through the placenta and for possibly either sleepy or respiratory depressed um, babies when they arrive. Uh, PCAs, so you've got the parent um, patient controlled analgesias, uh, remifentanil and fentanyl, which are one of the new age um, uh, options we give our patients, especially when things like regional techniques are um, not um, uh, appropriate or um, they're uh, contradictions for giving them. However, they have huge safety um, issues and you need to be, you know, have your patient under very strict monitoring. So for that one, for that one reason, they're not um, one of the most popular um, means of giving opioids. Procedural, and then of course we have our epidurals, our CSEs, and I've put this in block in in brackets, cordals, because um, I've not seen cordals being given for uh, labour uh, analgesia purposes, given that epidurals work so well. Um, there's obviously that high risk of inadvertent uh, intrathecal injections with cordals, and of course intravascular ones too. Um, epidurals have their, uh, certainly have their role, and I'm sure all of us have our spiel of consent and things that we talk to our patients before we give them uh, an epidural to help with analgesia and there's various, various techniques. It would be great to um, hear back about any, any other techniques that you use um, within the epidural, so dural puncture epidurals or just straightforward epidurals. Uh, whether you have them in a continuous infusion or whether you do patient controlled ones or, or both um, and same with CSEs um, again all have everyone has a different technique in which they use uh, uh, with the CSE especially in terms of proportions of what uh, they put into into the intrathecal aspect as well as the epidural so um, those are one of our options um this is the table i was telling you a little bit about um which looks at all of the um non uh, uh pharmacological um options of giving uh analgesia a little bit about the mechanism of actions um and uh this corner here is where we're looking at the evidence um which again there doesn't seem to be uh, too much of but uh for women that use a combination of these things, um, 
some of them swear by it. Um, we know that this has certain uh, improvement in their um, outcome. Uh, when you go see them the next day, they have um, certain, certain women, you know, believe that certain things worked for them. Uh, and it is a, a lot of this is to do with subjective pain relief. Um, uh, rather than um, objectively being able to reduce pain relief, because we know everyone's perception through labor is different. But at the end of the day, when you have a patient with, who is satisfied with the analgesia that they got or with it, you know, the attention they got and the, the care that they received, the overall outcome of making um, that experience favorable for the person, um, so that if they were to choose to come back again and have another child, um, you're eliminating um, a huge aspect of anxiety and post-traumatic stress for them. Um, right, so my take home messages. So we are underutilizing um, our analgesia techniques, either due to a lack of demand, whether that could be due to lack of awareness um, or because we're just focusing on things other than analgesia, perhaps because we don't see the importance in it. Um, again, I've plugged in this uh, a little fact here. So there was a study done only back only 2021. Um, where only 8% of women that were spoken to went through this um, process were aware of various or if at all any analgesia techniques um, that can be offered during labor. Um, cost does not have to be an issue and um, this is why I did not specifically focus on the pharmacological aspect or the procedural because I want us all to have a little think about the um, alternative therapies we can also use um, in order to make um, the experience better. Um, we know pharm you know pharmacological agents work. We know procedural ones. We know epidural CSEs work, um, and of course they have their roles, which is proven. Um, but there's a lot of other things as well that you know if if we are in a situation where we're in a low resource setting and we don't have epidural pumps so we can't um, you know get people coming in and monitoring patients and strong opioids as frequently then there's alternatives we can do so I would like us not to think just of cost as being a roadblock to this um, and of course um, there's a big cultural aspect of why is it that um, women are allowed to be in or are let to you know allowed to be in pain um yes you know we've 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 had babies throughout time uh, and we didn't have analgesia back then but we do now so perceptions such as it'll make me love my baby more or it'll have a negative impact on our baby or no one in my family my mother my grandma my great grandmother didn't need it why should i need it um or i need to you know experience the pain of natural childbirth um, to be accepted within the community. Um, these are perhaps notions we need to um, question, maybe. Um, uh, maybe it's time that we uh, change the narrative of what is allowed and what isn't allowed for women within our society. Um, perhaps we should be pushing and advocating for our patients a bit more um, if they don't know that actually a lot of our techniques are safe for them, they're safe for their babies, and they're not going to have an impact on, you know, childbirth. It's not, an epidural is not going to make it more likely for you to have a cesarean section, then perhaps they'll be less um, uh, worried about accepting them. So, um, yeah, these are my take home messages, and maybe we should be communicating to our patients a little bit more about their experiences or their um, ideas of what labor is going to be like, what their concerns are, and how we deal with those expectations overall. Um, and I hope by the end of this, uh, you feel like this cat um, who is standing in a very unfamiliar situation with lots of challenges around it but looks pretty brave enough to take them on um, so thank you very much there's my uh, email address and twitter handle feel free to um, message me any uh, questions or comments and i will either try to attend through the answer platform um, or i will uh, share back with you I will stop sharing the screen now.
<clears throat> right. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sonia. This is was um, a really, really good, comprehensive, and um, um, it is, it is, it is, it's, an, it's one of those fundamental uh, aspects of uh, a safer approach to parturients, which is uh, we are all uh, a lot of more, a lot of African countries we have lacking of the concept of how we have to aggressively managing pain in, in, in obstetrics. And we'll have the question and answer at the end. Um, and let us just move now to another uh, fantastic speaker is um, uh, Dr. Shabani um, uh, Majaliwa. He's, he, I'm really pleased to have him with us today. He's a consultant anesthetist in intensive care. He's a former resident at Lille Hospital and Mien's University Teaching Hospital in France. And he is a senior anesthetist now in, in mobile surgical team, a surgical program run by the Red Cross, International Red Cross, ICRC, for weapon wounded patient in Madguri uh, State in Nigeria. Uh, his career and accomplishment, he, he has a lot of um, uh, accomplishments. He's been working for IC for seven years now. Um, his special interest in capacity building and uh, regional anesthesia and closed loop anesthesia and scopion. Uh, uh, um, in venomation, so in low resources setting, plus the point of care ultrasound. So I'm really I'm glad to have him uh, whole ho here today, and and hopefully you're going to enjoy uh, this uh, this meeting. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shivani, as I've uh, been introduced uh, earlier. Yeah, it's a great opportunity uh, for me and on behalf of ICRC to discuss with you or to present uh, to you about acute pain management in trauma patients, specifically for weapon wounded. Uh, this is uh, somehow ICRC experience. Yeah, ICRC is a humanitarian organization, and we work to ensure humanitarian protections and to make sure that, um, I mean, uh, the uh, patient or the population affected by conflicts uh, have uh, a good support from the organization. Yeah, when it comes to RCRC hospital projects, sometimes people are a bit afraid to know that you have to work in your resource context. In fact, if you see on your left, this is our basic setups and in our standard setup, you have syringe pump, you have, uh, you have a basic monitor with uh, I mean, standard features like HU2, SPU2, you no know, invasive blood pressures, and so on. And uh, on your right, uh, we have, if possible, we try to set up a dedicated area for regional and anesthesia. So this space is very important when it's come for capacity buildings because it gives us uh, opportunity to have all the times to teach other colleagues, other residents and nursing about the regional anesthesia because you can perform your blocks before, I mean, uh, you resume the procedures. So you don't really have to fight for the OT, the surgeon. You have the time to teach and train and hands-on experience. So, but when it's come really to work in this context, you have to know that so you don't have all the resources as in civilian hospital. You may have some limitation regarding some drugs and all, not all the toxins you can use. So you have to always try to weight your risk and benefit of each drugs of each drugs you can use. And uh, it's very important that you know your limits and at uh, and you shouldn't harm that the most the most important message. So why pain control is important for surgical patients? 
So now it's had really early ambulation, early rehabilitation, it's improved healing process and prevent some surgical complication. It uh, prevents stress, anxieties, and uh, the involvement of two chronic pains. And also, as the patient is more active uh, and belating, you know, so there is effect relief to prevent DVT and the pulmonary embolism. Overall, you have your patient who is happy and will be a discharge and go back to his normal activity. It's really a virtual, a virtual circle. So we're going to talk uh, about principle of perioperative peri pain management, preoperative pain management, intraoperatives, and postoperative pain management. And uh, briefly, we we'll talk about uncontrolled severe pain, what the strategy you can have while working in, uh, in the field or in lower resource settings. And they will give, we'll finish by a summary of a perioperative pain management in RCRC setting. So when it comes to talk about perioperative pain management, it relies on the following principles. First, multimodal analgesia, procedure specific analgesia, assessment, reassessment of pain, and pain recovery after surgeries, and preventive analgesia. So multimodal analgesia give uh, a lot of advantage due to mainly to this um, synergistic effects. And uh, it really have uh, a spare, the opioid spare, sparing effect. And uh, you have less also side effects because all the, those are reduced and you, you can use the synergistics to have a good, I mean, uh, optimal pain management relief. So in RCRC multimodal analgesia, so we use different components pharma, pharmacologically and no pharmacological, uh, I mean components. When it's come for pharmacological components, we use mainly uh, ketamine that can be used at sub anesthetics dose at the bolus sets, depending on the lens of uh, procedure, can give ketamine at the bolus, followed by the infusion, the same for ketamine, the same for lidocaine, magnesium. And also we give dexamethasone as single shot. Uh, beside adjuvant, you have some basic analgesic as uh, ibuprofen, decosinac, and paracetamol. Sometimes in post-operative period, if we have uh, some neuropathic pain profile, you can use gabapentin as preventive uh, measure, or you can just as to treat neuropathic pain if there is any neuropathic component of the pain. And mainly, you have opioids, morphine, which is gold standard for acute pain. Sometimes, in post-operative period, we can use slow dose of fentanyl to relieve the pain. And we more and more in our setup, we use regional anesthesia in pre-op, intraoperatives, and postoperative uh, pain control. Uh, beside for pharmacological uh, components, there's also no pharmacological components, mainly psych psychological support and rehabilitation. And this rehabilitation is really, really important. Uh, mainly for children, so we try to I mean to to have the children have a normal life, you know, uh, with the support of psychologically, uh, I mean, uh, social worker and uh, psychologist. So regarding procedure specific analgesia, I will emphasize mainly for children to really try to avoid any stress regarding cannulation, change of dressings, when it's become repetitive, repetitive and also to, to try really to make children's return to a normal life, despite he's still in our hospital set. So for instance, for IV cannulation or blood drawings, we use MLA creams. 
So sometimes, uh, for instance, in pre-operative area or in preparative, I mean, setup in the recovery, we have a dedicated place for children. This is what you call children anesthesia friendly environments. When we try to create really an environment where the children can feel really uh, secure and they can have some small toys, they can use uh, they can use some iPad with some games in. So it's very, very important to uh, at least to decrease the stress related to this environment. Uh, to I mean to decrease the stress related to operation room theater environments. So regarding enhanced recovery after surgeries, this is how we do it. We try really to optimize perioperative fluid and body temperatures. We avoid as much as necessary some surgical drains, nasogastric tubes, catheters. We do early enteral intakes and early supported mobilization. For instance, in cesarean sections, it become really standard not to wait six hours before we initiated oral intake uh, if there's no any complication any issue during the procedures c-section and B, we allow i mean the patient to take the clear i mean the fluid straight after the uh, discharge from the OT in the ward they can take straight away i mean clear fluid and after six hours they can take uh, I mean, normal food, light food, yeah. So assessments and reassessment of pain, this is very important because you, this, this is the only way you can know how your intervention is, as you effective or you are not effective. So in our settings, if we receive a patient in with, uh, acute pain, so we try really to assess before the intervention, if it's morphines or other things. After the intervention, we do at least four times a day as assessment. This is also true for during post-operative periods. After that, a normal routine, we do two times per day follow-up about the pains. This is the same as all vital sign. We do the same for pain at least two times a day. Yeah, and once a week we we do we perform what you call like pain rounds. So this is very important to do a follow up with those who have somehow neuropathic pains because you cannot relieve the pain and one day you need either to increase gradually the dose of some drug like abamazepine or dabapantin or amitriptyline. So when it's come to preoperative pain management, a morphine really is a, a gold standard. In our setting, we try to use IV as much as possible. We initiate by titrations. When the patient is relieved, we switch to subcutaneous. We don't use patient control analgesia, IV patient control analgesia because of uh, limitation in terms of follow-up. Yeah, this is a reality due to the environment we are working in. And uh, we are not sure that all the nurses during the night nice shift, for instance, they'll be, I mean, uh, they'll be really at ease to follow this kind of patients or if there's any issue regarding the, the machine, if they can know how to change it, because most of the time you will not even be there to do a follow-up at night shift. And uh, above, uh, besides, we try to teach uh, all the staff uh, about the complication of morphines and how to initiate it. Uh, I mean, uh, the treatment of overdose. I mean, not only to monitors, but also how they, with the protocol, how they can treat any overdose related to morphine. And we make sure that naloxone and basic airway kit is available whenever morphine is used. And all our patients 
on morphine are followed by, we have a basic monitors and also we assess sedation score. And yeah, this is mainly what we are doing to avoid any complication related to morphine. So this is our chart we are using, somehow flow chart regarding the management of morphine. Yeah, there's a pen score, sedation score, and the dilution. Yeah. So for pre-operative pain management, we, we can use also ketamine 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligram kilo every 20 minutes. This is really sometimes help to reduce pain score and also to reduce the total dose of narcotic if you are using, for instance, morphine. If you combine with low dose of ketamine, it, be, it help you to reduce the total amount of uh, morphine that you can use. Yeah, but you have to consider mainly ketamine when you have hemorrhagic shock, respiratory distress, and if there is uh, any significant risk of developing either condition. So you should consider when the pain is not coming under control after morphine. Sometimes if the pain is not controlled with morphine, adding some low dose of ketamine then might help you to, to control the pain. So for intraoperative pain management, first we are going to talk about uh, regional anesthesia. And uh, I will emphasize on some particularities uh, of regional anesthesia for weapon wounded. Uh, when it comes for weapon wounded, it's different from civilian because uh, the lethality of wounding agents, you may have patients who are victim of uh, improvised explosive device. You may have some bone blasts, injury, and mine gunshot and also the anatomy distribution of wound. So sometimes you have patient who may have chest injury combined with abdominal injury, combined with, I mean, extremities injury. So, and most of the patients arrive not just after the injury, sometimes you may have critical patients, uh, not because of the injury, but because of the delay, the patient may wait two, three days before they are, they managed to arrive at the facilities to have uh, their surgery. So, and mortality and uh, is really high regarding uh, what we have been uh, talking about. You have patients really are poorly traumatized. They have really, really many injuries and, and pre-hospital uh, and post-operative mortality can be high compared to civilians' traumatism. And sometimes you have some disruption, disruption of normal anatomy. You may have some patient who have all the upper extremity blown out, so blown up. So it's really difficult to sometimes to I mean to treat these patients because you have some patient with a trauma of upper extremity, with a trauma with a head injury, with trauma of a low extremity, abdomen and injury. So it's not really as in civilian life. So this is a list of our most common block in the field. So this, the basic that, that someone to work really, that the basic block, if you, for instance, uh, we usually use in, uh, in the field, you have axial brachial plexus block, you have femoral nerve blocks, uh, adductor canal blocks, popliteal sciatic blocks, erector spinae blocks, fascial lacca block. Fascial lacca block is uh, very important, mainly for preoperative, for instance, to control pain related to the fracture of the neck of the femur or the femoral traumas. And uh, yes, and also, it's uh, important to fascia iliac is very important for postoperative pain. You may use a spinal, for instance, for hip fractures, but after you finish the procedures, you can also use fascia iliac blocks for pain management as a postoperative pain management strategies. 
So basically, this is uh, this is uh, axillary blocks, and uh, I'll emphasize on the landmark. You see, the landmark is conjectured sandrant. We uh, head of humerus, axillary artery, and axillary veins. So to give you some tips when it's come to do axillary blocks. We should do in these orders. First, you try to block the muscular ketones, then the radials and the ulnar, and finally you finish by major nerves. So it's also very important to not put much pressure on the probe when you are doing uh, this, uh, this block because the the uh, I mean the targets I mean the nerves and vascular and the, and the vein they are very superficial so when you have you put a lot of pressures the vein collapse and sometimes you can be in the vein and you may not see it you may not see because the vein is completely collapsed due to the pressure so it become really a problems and you have you you have the risk of local anesthesia systemic toxicity so you have to really to make sure that you are not really compressing the vein around the artery and also you may know that sometimes there is uh, in 60 16 percent you have the variation of muscular ketones which is doesn't it is still at axillary we still with uh, within the nerve bundles i mean within a approach i mean close to medians uh, close to I mean, close to major nerves. So this is the, this is about supraclavicular blocks. It's very important to, to see, uh, I mean, the, to see the location, how we do it. We prefer to do it in plan. Uh, from medial and uh, from lateral to medial. And the most important landmark are the first rib, the lung, and sometimes you can see the pleura sliding with uh, sliding motion in inspiration and expiration. Another important landmark is sub, I mean, supraclavicular artery. And the bundles is located. I mean, lateral to sub, subclavicular artery. So this is very important. You must mention that with these blocks, you have to be very careful, but you are, because you are very, very close to pleuradome, so there is a risk of pneumothorax. So, and uh, whenever you inject, you feel that there's a lot of pressure, you need to change the direction. And at all the time, you should be able to see the tip of your needle, which is very, very important. And don't move the needle if you don't see the tip. This is very, very important. Yeah, um, I'm going to talk about uh, sciatic glottitalia combined to adductal canal. This is very important blocks when it's come to for the patient with uh, below knee injury, because it helps you to avoid even spinal. If you come, when, when you have a stable patient, so with this block, it helps you to do, I mean, lower limb surgery. Sometimes in stable patients, as with uh, ultrasound guided, we can reduce really to minimum the amount of local anesthesia. We can do bilateral sciatic glottitis combined to adductal canal blocks, mainly for, I mean, for unstable patients. So the main tips regarding this block is that the patient in spine position. With this position, we have a lateral approach, as you can see on the picture on your left, and uh, you have the needle, which is perpendicular to the probe beam, and it allows it, uh, allow us to have a good visibility of the needle shafts. 
So also in this position, you can also, without moving the patient, perform your adductal canal blocks. So it's very important when you are scanning uh, for sciatic proctitia nerves, you can try to inject at the initiating when the, the sciatic starts uh, to divide into between uh, sciatics, Loctitea and common perineal, it's very important. And the block, as you can see in the picture, the needle tips it within the two inside the perineal, um, perineal sheet, which is very important. You have a very, very uh, uh, onset, uh, it's very quick to install the, your block. So during the intraoperative pain management, you can also perform wound infiltration. This is, can be done the, by the surgeons. For the same, this can be, uh, I mean, uh, we use mainly level BP vaccine between two and 20 ml with a single injection. And uh, for instance, in cesarean section, we can do infiltrations. Otherwise, if you cannot do infiltration at the end of surgery, you can do your top block. And uh, it's really very, very important uh, when uh, you have to do, for instance, um, uh, if we can enhance recovery after a cesarean section, that's uh, the part of our protocols. It's really, I mean, uh, very, very, uh, it's really depend for the patients. During intraoperative pain management, uh, adjuvants are very, very important. Depending on the length, length of surgery, we can perform, uh, we can perform, uh, I mean, we can do a combination of these drugs. As you can see, we can give lidocaines, bolus plus um, uh, IV infusion. Uh, for instance, for in our settings, we give a bolus of two milligrams kgs of lidocaine, followed by 1.5 to 2 milligram uh, lidocaine per kilo per hour. And also we can, the same, we can start by ketamine. We give a bolus of 0 0.5 milligram per kilo, followed by 0 0.2 milligram per kilo per hour for ketamines. The same magnesium, we can give a bolus of between 30 to 40 milligrams IV bolus followed by IV infusion. And we give, regarding the, if there's no any contraindications, we can also give no NSAID drugs like the clofinac. So also we give the examinatazone, which is very helpful for no therefore meetings. So in post-operative pain management, we use what we call reverse pain lighters. The concept is that pain is more severe immediately after surgery or after trauma or any acute medical illness. So the pain gradually decreases over the time and with the healing. So this allows us a gradual reduction in analgesic requirements. So it means when you have a mild pain, you can use a step one. I mean, you use paracetamol plus no NSAID drugs like diclofenac, ibuprofen. When you have treatments, moderate pains, it means you go to step two. You can use the same drugs as in step one plus what weak opioids or low dose of strong opioid oral. So when you are you have a severe pain, so it means you are on step three, you can use morphine, per PO, IV, or subcutaneous. And when you have uncontrolled severe pains, this is this is mainly the time you can use ketamine plus vaginal anesthesia. Sometimes we have to bring the patient in the OT because he has a pain, acute pain, severe pain, which is not relieved uh, despite morphine and ketamine. For this kind of patient, we, we do, I mean, uh, at least once a day, 
we can use a block. This is true, for instance, for below knee amputation or above knee amputation with a neuropathy component of pain. This is uh, our protocols, what we call reverse pain management for the postoperative pain in adults. They're also the same for pediatrics. We just talk about this one. As you can see, if the pain is uh, severe, you use uh, morphine plus paracetamol plus ibuprofen. When it comes to uncontrolled pain, you have to add ketamines and see the possibilities, if possible, to do a block. Moderate pains is uh, the same. I mean, you use weak opioid plus paracetamol ibuprofen. You can see that in our setup, when it comes to morphine, we mainly use in recovered air or high dependency unit. So when you have moderate pain and mid pain, all those drugs can be managed in the world. So we are going to talk about infraanginal fascia lateral compartment blocks. This is very, very important block. And with this block, you can use it, for instance, during the pre-op period, for instance, if you have patient with a fracture of the neck of the femur, which is very painful, in order to do your spinal anesthesia and to avoid the pain during, if you had to, during the position of the patient or during the transport of the patient, you can use uh, infraangular fasciliaca compartment blocks, which is very, very active, effective in this, in this indication. But also during in postoperative period, you can use also these uh, uh, fasciliac compartment blocks, for instance, for patient who has a femoral fractures. If you have above knee amputation, it's very, very effective block. Yeah, I want to show with you uh, as uh, as you can see, you have to be to on top of fasci, I mean iliac muscles. You have to try to find this space and see the spreads of local anesthetics, and you see the tip of the needle is a bit far from the femoral nerves. And to make sure it, that your block is working, you should have the spreads backward and forwards, backwards, I mean, backward uh, to uh, below sartorius muscle and forward towards uh, femoral uh, nerves. This is very important to have these uh, spreads all over of uh, local anesthetic. So in summary uh, of operative pain management in RCRC, it means that yes, in all patients except contraindicated in pre-op assessment, we should do pre-op assessment and physical examination, physical exam, and uh, we try to adjust or continue when possible if there's any medication whose sudden cessation may provoke withdrawal syndrome such as opioid. Because in some area you may find there are some patient, there are combatants, there are fighters, but beside this, they are also addicted. So for this patient, you might be very careful not to stop abruptly uh, and you may have uh, some withdrawal syndrome, so you need to be careful. So we have to pre treat pre-existing pain and action to if it exists when you have patients uh, at pre-operative with acute, uh, really, really acute pain, you have to use morphine. And if possible, if it's not relief, you can add ketamines. And in some patients, you may consider regional anesthesia for instance, if you have to, to move patient for medical evacuation with uh, fractures or wound on the femur, you can give fasciliac blocks, which is very important. Sometimes even 
if you have to move a patient with upper extremities. For Medivac, if there's any possibilities, you can also give supraclavicular blocks, which will work very well in this condition. So in intraoperatives, except when contraindicates, we use mainly fentanyl, paracetamol, beclofenac, and uh, we can use ketamine, dexamethasone, uh, lidocaine, uh, bonus, and continuous intraoperatively. When there is any indication, we can use wound infiltration, mainly for laparotomy and caesarean section. And in some patients, we can consider only when indicated the use of regional anesthesia and adjuvant, as I mentioned before, I mean lidocaine and magnesium. So thank you very much. This is uh, briefly what uh, I want to share with you about our experience regarding the management uh, of uh, weapon wounded. So I should mention for those who have uh, are French speaking, if you have any question, you can ask your question in French and I've tried to translate it in English and give the answer in French and English. So thank you very much. Right, thank you very much um, to Sonia and Dr. Shabani. Um, that's what really, really both of you were fantastic talks. Uh, I really personally enjoyed it. And um, um, Dr. Shabani, are you, are you around just for, um, Dr. Sonia, are you around just for, um, for coming life? Yeah. Dr. Shabani, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Okay. Fantastic. So thank you very much for both of you. Honestly, just uh, <clears throat> I really enjoyed it. That, um, both presentations are great. And, um, I think we have um, uh, some questions. We'll go ahead. Um, I know you are all busy, but just we're trying to, give it, to, get, to get it as quick as possible to make the relevant. So um, Sonia, you, you had a very, very uh, um, excellent talk about the, the safer approach and the pharmacological, <clears throat> non-pharmacological treatment of um, uh, for obstetric uh, pain. And this is really a very hot topic, especially in Africa. And I know that this, this have, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of uh, legalities regarding how we can approach the virtual and what's the concept. And I like that, that you're emphasizing the way that this is, this is not something, not, not an option. This is an mandatory and this is something very important in approaching parturians. So um, some of the question which come over to me, um, um, so um, the question is saying, um, what's the steps we can think about, uh, Sonia, for safer epidural service in low resources areas? So if you are, I think the question is rephrasing, if, you, if, you, if you're planning to, to start an epidural service, because the epidural is always having this sort of uh, complication and problems uh, initiating. So, do you have any any guide or anything just for starting a safer epidural in low resources area? Sure. Um, so, I can only maybe suggest a few things. Um, a lot of this will depend on what, how much you have within your system. Um, I'd like to think of it as things that you need to things that you need to get sorted out within the system, and then things that you need to sort out within um, equipment and training. So within the system, I think the first important step is to get a multidisciplinary team involvement. So not only have you know the team anesthesia on board because we'll be predominantly the team running that service, but also having the midwives and the obstetricians on board. Mm. Um, and coming out of some of the Q&As and chats, it sounds like that may well be the biggest, uh, the hardest step to go to kind of get forward, getting everyone on board. Once you've got that sort of thing, having a really good think about what protocols and guidelines you need to set up that suits your 
set up so your system um it's it there's, there's no point picking up a protocol from a different setting that might not yeah. work for your system so have a little think about that, that sort of thing there's plenty of evidence to um suggest you know think using epidurals have ha, does not have an impact on how long labor is or um how you know any sort of um, outcomes, so whether having instrumental or cesarean section, it doesn't really have a role to play in that. So we can put that sort of fear aside. Um, and then there's things like um, having regular training embedded within the system for the staff before you start off something like this, um, having enough people on board so no drawing knowing where to draw the lines so let's say you know you've got um two pumps that you can utilize um that's the limit you're not going to push and put epidurals in four people and swap and change your pumps you know you need to have that safety border drawn up um, and then, of course, things like equipment. So you need to be able to have enough of equipment, have the epidural, you know, the dose, the concentration. Think about all of that before you set that up. What works for you? Perhaps avoiding opiates um, in the epidural so that you don't have to have that extra level of monitoring or that worry, um, that kind of thing. So, uh, and then, of course, um, as with every new system, you need to audit the system to see if it works, follow your patients up, follow the outcomes up, and see how you can improve the system. And that's generally how we think about going, um, going about setting up a system in, 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 in any fashion, um, in any system. Um, I hope that's a little bit helpful yeah. and <clears throat> a bit similar to what you would yeah. do. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think uh, I'm just it, it's the same. It's, 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 it's managing pain doesn't prolong labor. This is the, the ultimate uh, message we need to, um, to, need to deliver. Uh, it's a, a humane thing. It's just something which has been approved. And it's, there's, a, there's a strong, extremely evidence that uh, managing pain in obstetric is, is actually a solution and treatment for a lot of um, uh, obstetric yeah. problems, uh, um, um, and one of them is preeclampsia. So that if you have a preeclampsia or have even uh, and um, uh, other things like maternal heart disease, obstetric uh, management of labor is quite management of pain and labor is quite important. Now, so um, what, do you, what, what what's the local aesthetic if you are going to actively uh, uh, activating your epidural uh, sorry, for cesarean section per se? Do you have any recipe or any yeah. aesthetic do you, do you use? If um, activated? This there's two main ones that I use. Um, the ones that I use quite commonly, especially in the UK and possibly worldwide here is um, so, uh, an increasing dose, but up to about 20 mils or so of 0.5% liver bupivacaine. Mm. Um, obviously you need to make sure that your patient is monitored, you're in a safe area and there's no other contraindication and that you're happy that your epidural is actually working. Mm. There's no point topping up an epidural which is patchy or your, you know, is working inadequately because inadvertently you will not get an adequate block for cesarean section. One of the other methods that's um, gaining a lot of popularity possibly because it works maybe just that little bit quicker is a combination of lignocaine and adrenaline so this one is again up to about 20 mils or so um, of two percent lignocaine mixed with 0 0.1 mils of one in a thousand adrenaline so you pre-mix that and you top your patient up accordingly you know systematically five ten mils at a time to, see, yeah. to achieve your um, adequate block yeah. Do you do any 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 spinal renal axle for obstetric bleeding or any suspected obstetric bleeding? Uh, yes and no. It depends how much the bleeding is, the how urgently you need to go to theatre, um, how much of resuscitation is being done, if there's any other contraindications. As with everything, you have to balance your risks. So yeah. if you have a patient who is bleeding but not profusely or, you know, some retained placenta or something. So there's a trickle of bleed rather than hosing out. And you've got some time to create a stable situation with fluid resuscitation or blood resuscitation, then you would rather do that. For me personally, I would rather do that and do a spinal anesthetic than jump into the general anesthetic. Of course, you know, you have patients where their airway risk is higher than any other hemorrhage risk or cardiovascular um, instability. So you would manage that accordingly as well, depending again on the time and the situation. So there's no hard and fast rule with 
anything really, especially in obstetric. It is all just about balancing your risk and doing what is safe in your in your hand. Yeah. Right. So I um, have another one from Ahi or from Gambia, which is about the um, uh, quite tricky one, which is I don't know if uh, it's about the cultural concepts for women which is facing pain during labor to show their strength and there seems to be resistance. There is some form of resistance on the concept of pain control in some areas of Africa. So um, do, you do you have any any sort of, um, I think this is kind of, as Dr. Pai, I think from Gambia, I think, I think this is a very good question because it's always, oh, I almost also had this problem when some all uh, in villages and poor areas in Egypt where we uh, we used to practice obstetric anesthesia where there is, um, there's some sort of, um, I think you emphasize this also in the presentation about how the man, mothers are, are just, don't have this culture that my mom and my, my grandma are just already having the so why why I'm getting something different? Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult and it's not an easy, you know, uh, cultural myth to challenge, but it's one of those things that I think we will have to keep persisting with. Uh, we have a lot of data now, we have a lot of advances in technology. Uh, we know that, you know, we're getting better at maternal mortality. We're doing things in a way that is making childbirth safer, or at least we're trying to. Uh, and part of that process may well be analgesic and our developments within medicine to make um, uh, uh, having children safer and better. Um, in an ideal way, uh, you would talk to the patient about this before they're in labor somehow, you know, through an antenatal setup. Of course, that's not possible all the time. And majority of the time, we're just presented with patients who come in with these ideals. Um, uh, I think we underestimate the um, uh, the support network a patient has. So the, the partners that they come in, whether it's their mums or their um, other women within the society that come in with um, or, or are present um, and speaking to them in conjunction with the patient can also be helpful in convincing the, the laboring woman when it comes to uh, the fact that analgesia is not your enemy. It's not going to do harm to your baby. It's not going to do harm to you. And I think that's probably the base that we need to focus on, yeah. that um, analgesia is not a bad thing um, and it's not going to do harm. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Right, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Shabani, uh, we have some questions for you. Um, I don't know if you have seen this in the chat box, it's the same uh, about things about uh, the ultra, uh, in areas where there's no ultrasound machine, is it safer to do um, uh, landmark? I think I think it's not under, I think it's been it's landmark um, anatomy uh, techniques for upper limb or lower limb blocks. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, I think it's not safe today's um, 21st century to use landmark technique regarding the risk of uh, local anesthesia systemics. And mainly he mentions in low resource settings, I mean, when you have, uh, you don't have enough capacity for resuscitation. I think uh, for me, if there's uh, any alternative technique like general anesthesia with ketamine, it's safer to do it than doing landmark techniques. I think we have to push people to invest in low, uh, low cost uh, ultrasound machine. They are very common now. I think we have to push on this. Thank you. That's great. Yes, I agree 100%. Thank you very much. This is, this is um, I, I like the way you mentioned that it's really, a don't, don't, don't make harm if you are not, uh, if, you are, if you don't have, you have a problem in understanding or using new technology or using machine. Sometimes if you don't have much experience, you don't have much, you may cause harm. So uh, uh, sedation in general and aesthetic is always an, a good option, an alternative option. Right, uh, so personally for, for food surgeries and food problem, not food surgery, food, food injuries, when there's plus injuries in the food, the trauma and emergency service, you prefer doing ankle block or um, uh, single shot for pleteal? Yeah, I, I, it, it depends on the number you have. Normally, if you are not very busy and the patient need to be, I mean, to move as ambulatory surgeries, uh, ankle block is much better. If someone has to move, if the patient has to move the same day, but if this patient has to stay in the hospital, it's, I hope most of the time I do single shots for PTM. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Rabani, uh, this is for me, uh, for myself, for just a uh, question. Do you, do you, which the common block, just uh, out of interest for you doing an emergency service, yeah. an emergency yeah. yeah. trauma patient, yeah. the most common block? The most common blocks uh, in emergency situation, we do separate blocks or infraclavic blocks because it gives you anesthesia of the whole upper limbs. A another block we usually do mainly in emergency to relieve the pain, it fas fasciaca iliaca blocks, compartment block, which is very effective. And if you want to, for instance, to relieve the pain and the same time, time use the block for surgery, in this case, if it's the below knee injury, we use proprietary block combined with adductor canal blocks. Mainly, if you master these three techniques, you are able to do most of the upper limbs and lower limbs surgery. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Um, I think we, we managed most of the questions here. So, uh, guys, thank you very much. This is was, was very, both presentation was actually spot on and this really, really good. And I personally. Sorry. Uh, yes, Sonia. Dr. Mohammed, I'm going to just very quickly, I noticed there's that one question in the Q&A, yeah. which we didn't quite get to. Um, oh, yes, yes uh, we have. I'm sorry. Just so it's, it's, I'll just be very quick with this one. Yeah. It's a very tricky one, um, but I think the bottom line is we have to advocate for our patient's best interest. Um, yeah. If we have data, which we do, to you know, to suggest that analgesia does not prolong labor and does not complicate labor, that we really need to be pushing for it. You just have to be persistent, unfortunately. Um, if, if your obstetricians would like to see data, feel free to, you know, arrange a departmental meeting where you can perhaps present something like labor analgesia okay. and the evidence based around it, um, or even do audits to say, look, we gave so-and-so women epidurals, the outcome was not any different to the other patients that did not receive it. Uh, and maybe approach it in a more scientific fashion like that. Um, I hope that also helps um, answer that question a little bit. Yeah. Surgeons need to trouble everywhere. <laughs> right. Okay. That's fine. So um, thank you very much for both of you. I think we we um, uh, we really really very appreciating what you've done for us today and for uh, all Africa. And hopefully this is uh, not going to be the last time. So it's going to be repeated again more and more topics related to the vision anesthesia. So uh, thank you very much all of you and uh, for all our, our attendance. Uh, and just want to remind you that we will have the recording available on our website in the e-learning part of the absolute.net and also the live streaming YouTube channel is already available if you want to go back to the to the recording um, also we are um, we are um, having the next webinar which is going to be next month we're going to be public on our twitter account and website it's going it's going to be completely in french and um, um, we have also very fantastic people will give us some uh, interesting talks. It's going to be a surprise. So thank you very much, all, and um, yeah, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, Shavani. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. you. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.